Good afternoon, family. Welcome. Um, please j- join me and stand, if you will, for the reading of God's Word today. Our passage today is Romans 8, verses 26 through 30. We'll read the passage together as you're able, and uh, if you uh, will join me, uh, at the end of it, I'll have a, a little bit of light liturgy and ask you to, uh, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, and ask you to respond with, thanks be to God. Okay, join me now. Uh, Romans 8, 26-30. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers." And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Over the past few weeks, uh, we have examined the first three points of the doctrines of grace, um, as laid out in the English uh, acronym TULIP, I'm familiar with now. In this formulation, they're also called the five points of Calvinism, as we've said before. Now, uh, Mike shares a little bit of his story of how he came to reform theology uh, in, in, I guess, the first week. And, uh, and John has shared his story of how he came to Christ a few times, in kind of, I think, in a previous sermon, in fact. But I never really shared my, how I came to the Reformed uh, view of, of Scripture. And I thought I'd start with sharing a little bit of my, my background in that today. Um, I can recall the first time I heard the term Calvinism, but I can't actually recall when I realized I was one. It's kind of a funny thing, right? It's like, I can remember when I heard it, but when did I start believing it? It just kind of snuck up on me, right? So I grew up in what we we considered a traditional Southern Baptist church. Um, And again, nothing wrong with Southern Baptist church. I love Southern Baptist churches. But interestingly, by the way, the lineage of Southern Baptist churches traces back to uh, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is basically back to uh, Reformed Theology. You know, to one of the form, early formulations of Reformed theology, they would have agreed and do, in many cases, with the doctrines of grace that we're talking about today. In fact, um, that actually changed at the turn of the century, the last century, not the current century, I guess you'd say. Um, but if, so if you go back 50 years, you'll find many Southern Baptists who would say that they chose God. But go back 150 years, you'll find just the opposite. The most Southern Baptists at the time would say, no, no, God chose me, All right? Um, but I first heard the Calvinist in a debate between two of my friends in a high school and youth group. One asserted that Calvinism destroyed the, any need for missions. Uh, the other, who had grown up at a Reformed church, said, but anything else destroys the sovereignty of God. Um, they drew me into the conversation and asked me what I thought, and I very intelligently asked, what's Calvinism? Because <laughs> sheltered a little bit, maybe, so... They explained, and I thought about it for a while, and then I said, I'm not sure which of you is right, but I don't think any amount of predestination removes the call of the Great Commission. Um, To this day, I don't think I was wrong in that response, although I don't think it was for me, it was was from the Spirit. Often we debate straw men in these types of circumstances, and that's what my two friends were doing. They were actually debating straw men, you know, familiar with the concept and logical fallacy of the straw man, right? You attack not the actual argument, but a caricature, a straw man of the argument, right? One was, so the one who was responding and saying that destroyed missions was responding to a straw man view of Calvinism, often called hyper-Calvinism. Now, that in essence, it turns God's sovereignty into a type of fatalism, right? Now, Mike mentioned distortion briefly a few weeks ago, I think in his first sermon on the topic. The idea that since God has already chosen whom he has chosen, then there is no point sharing the gospel. Just those that God chose will come, right? This is a straw man view of Calvinism. And one I found to be common amongst many Christians I grew up with. They all assumed that, oh, you're a Calvinist. Well, you don't care about missions then. And that's not true at all. And in fact, we'll discuss later, it's actually very important for Calvinists to care about missions. My second brush of the doctrines of grace and TULIP came um, not that long ago, actually. Uh, it came in discussion with a friend of mine and a brother in Christ at one of the first churches I attended here in San Antonio. So it's probably been 15 years or so since I had this conversation with him. 
I believe it was the first, he was the first person who listed these five points and the, you know, the, an acronym, the acronym, the, the mnemonic TULIP to me. I never heard that before. At the time, I had been spending a lot of, uh, a lot of my time analyzing scripture and kind of reviewing some of my assumptions in light of scripture. Cause I'd grown up with certain beliefs and I was, I'd really gotten into like, well, is this true? I've always heard this and spending time and, and actually many of my beliefs at the time I, I readdressed and, and have actually changed. Uh, this being one clearly that I did. Uh, when my friend described the doctrines of grace to me, I realized I already believed and agreed with them. Um, as I said before, I don't know when that happened. I just said, oh yeah, no, that, that's, that makes sense. God is sovereign, therefore this is true. It just kind of made sense to me, right? But that's God's working, not mine, right? And so the funniest thing happened after that, and God did something I think was pretty amazing. I had a conversation with my wife, Marielle, just a soon after that conversation, I realized I was changing. My views had changed on this point. And I said, hey, yeah, I'm kind of coming to a different view of this than I think I've held before. Um, what do you think? It's just like, you know, what's funny is I have the same change of opinion. For her own studies, her own time in Scripture, and her own discussion she'd been having, she had been led the same path. And at the same time, we discovered that we'd both become reformed in that sense, right? Come to embrace the doctrines of grace. In the end, you could say that I had no choice in becoming a Calvinist, which is fair and seems fitting, I think, considering. So to the doctrines of grace, which is our topic for today, continuing here, we've called so far we have discussed T for total depravity of our acronym, right? That we have no power within ourselves to trust in God. No power within ourselves. The U, which we call unconditional election, God chooses whom he chooses, not based on anything they do. And L for limited atonement, that on a particular hill, a particular man died a particular death for a particular people, a people of God. So today we come to the I, for in English grammar, like T-U-L-I. Uh, so we're almost at the end, which we call irresistible grace. Now, on this subject, uh, what comes to mind when we hear the term irresistible grace? On the face of it, it seems to apply grace that cannot be resisted. That, you know, clearly a definitional term there. Um, since the general context is salvation, we might get a wrong picture, though, at this point, right? We think about salvific things and salvation. We might think, okay, so it can't be resisted. So God is dragging some people to heaven against their will, and other people who really want to go, they, no, sorry, you're not, you're not elect. You can't go. Right? That might be the picture that we have in our head at this point. Um, those people being metaphorically kicking and screaming into heaven, right? But nothing could be further from the truth. And in fact, here's a question. Can we resist God's grace? Well, think about that. And if so, what would resistance look like to God's grace? In our sinful and fallen state, I'd say we do resist God's grace. And in fact, that is basically the history of mankind, right? It looks like uh, from the fall to today, that every natural inclination, in fact, factually, every natural inclination of fallen man is, in fact, to resist and rebel against God's grace. In fact, resist and re rebel against God's every command. Now, before I'm driven out of the church as a heretic, um, let me clarify. I think the term irresistible grace, despite its usefulness in our mnemonic, is probably not the best one to describe the concept. So I'm trying to get to here, right? Misunderstood, it can lead to this false understanding. And uh, one we can quickly, I think, discount right off the bat and say, well, I resisted Christ's grace for most of my life until he, he chose me, right? Well, then so clearly I resisted his grace, so it's not irresistible. Well, that's not what we're saying. So what are we saying, right? It, the right and accurate meaning of this type of, of concept is God's grace is powerful enough to overcome our natural, sinful, and fallen resistance to it. That's the type of grace that God has. It's actually a pretty common thing to clarify this concept with the term effectual calling. Two kind of big words, effectual calling, right? In my own life, I came across this term, the first time I came across effectual calling, and th this concept was um, soon after I had discovered I was reformed, and uh, I went and picked up a book from a local half-price books uh, that was a copy of R.C. Sproul's What is Reformed Theology? I still recommend it. It's a great book. Uh, I don't know if there's any new edition since when I read it some times ago, but um, it's even if you find an old edition, it's great. Uh, and I think we actually gave away a copy at our party a few weeks ago. I believe there was one in there. So, um, 
So R.C. Sproul, a, a known theologian in this, who's now sadly passed away, um, he wrote a great book on this, and he used this term, effectual calling. I don't think it was uh, original to him, but it's the first place I heard effectual calling, so that's where I learned it from. So paraphrasing Dr. Sproul on this concept, he says, God's grace affects what God intends to effect by it. That kind of makes sense? God's grace affects what God intends to effect by it. It answers strongly and negatively the question, can God ever fail in his purpose? No, right? Now, we say that off the bat, no, of course not. God can't fail in his purpose, but how do we know that? Well, we know it because Scripture says it. Scripture says it very many times. The Old Testament, we see in Numbers, right? 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, or son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and he will not fulfill it? When God says something, he does it, right? He accomplishes what he sets forth to do. 1 Kings 8, 56. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel. According to all he has promised, not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he has spoken by Moses' his servant. Not a single thing failed that God promised. In the Psalms, we see that he's always faithful. Psalm 33, 4. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, and reminds them of this, that God is always faithful. 1 Corinthians 1, nine: God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. And again to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.24, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. And of course, Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is a small sampling of the many ways and places of Scripture we can find where it says that God is faithful and he will not fail in the task he has set for himself. If God sets out to do a work, he will complete it because he is God. He has the power, inclination, and he does not lie. So, having laid a foundation now for what we are talking about that was attended by the Scripture or this doctrine of irresistible grace, uh, let's turn to today's passage and read it and kind of find it in that context. What do you say? So Romans 8, 26 through 30, which we read earlier. Uh, what can we draw from this passage? Well, I want to look at maybe three things we can draw from this passage, right? Uh, first, let's focus on the word called. We see it a few times in this passage, both verses 28 and 30. I'm going to read them again. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Moving a little further here. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, or that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now notice what's about this word called here, that it is made in the form of a promise or a done deal. Uh, it is in the past tense, both in the original Greek as well as in our good translations here. Uh, in one sense... It does describe an invitation. So we might have a picture of God saying, hey, come to my party. I'm just calling you up. Hey, come on, join me. And you'd be like, nah, I feel like going today, right? So you might think that reading the word called, well, I got call people and it always show up, right? But it also, in more likely this case, means summons, like before a king. And you can't really deny the summons of a king, right? That's what you can walk away from. Um, it is actually descriptive, though, in this case, of a people who are called in both of his usages here, right? So Calvin, in his commentaries on this, um, includes, indicates that the intention of Paul in this scripture is to make known through outward means the inward calling. And Calvin makes many distinctions between the outward call, which is the gospel, and the inward call, which is the spirit working on our hearts, right? In other words, the calling here is an inward calling by the Father through the spirit on his chosen people. This inward calling is reflected and made visible in the outward call of the gospel. The question was asked again then is, if, is God, if he calls us, can he fail in that call? Well, we've already established that God cannot fail. So no, as we have seen, of course he cannot fail in that call. So to repeat from earlier, when we say that his call is effectual and irresistible, we mean that it has the effect it is intended to have on us. We see the similar language in our passage from First John, or sorry, from John last week. Um, as an aside, I joked last week after I came up after Mike's sermon that I would not have much to talk about today because Mike thoroughly covered the passage. Um, first, who am I kidding? I always have something to talk about. 
Uh, a friend of mine, actually, a co-worker once at a conference, I was, I was speaking at a con- conference to a crowd of engineers, you know, exciting people, and, um, and government officials and military people, because, you know, it's the kind of people I roll with. Uh, I'm an engineer, if you don't know that, as an aside. Um, so we were at this conference, and I was supposed to be speaking, and they give me the two-hour slot at this conference. It's a long slot, right? Um, and he said that when my friend, his name was Jeremy, he got up and said that when they gave me the long slot, um, they, were wor- they were not worried about me having enough content to cover the two hours I was allotted. He said, paraphrasing Trek, he said, no, the trick is not getting him to talk. The trick is getting him to shut up. <laughs> that was my friend Jeremy and coworker. Second, though, and no joke, um, I originally had intended to use the John 6 passage this week in my sermon, but Mike stole it from me. I'm teasing him, of course, because there's no reason I couldn't have still used it anyway. I mean, we have covered the same passage many times in the past. Um, Although I thought, in fact, a few days ago, I still was planning to use that passage. Uh, But in the end, though, I found that the um, our passage of Romans today and its emphasis on the Holy Spirit's work was what I really wanted to focus on here. That the Holy Spirit is effectual in its calling in us through through, through the the will of the Father. So I'm not going to repeat all of the full context that Mike gave us last week. Um, he did an excellent job, as I said. If you're curious, if you didn't hear it, go back and listen. Um, but I will point out a few highlights from the passage last week. First, from John 6, 37, we see the following. All the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Note how definite this is. All the Father gives will come. Not may, not have the option, could come, they will come. John 6, 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. God's will is that Jesus will lose none of God's chosen. Can God's will be thwarted? Again, Scripture testifies that no, God's will cannot be thwarted. John 6, uh, 44-45 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. And they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now first, the word draw in that passage. It might give you the wrong picture. Maybe you're thinking attract or woo. Like, you know, I, I, I drew my wife to me with my you know, manliness and sexiness, right? Maybe not so much. Um, okay. Uh, it, it was actually my humor, if you really want to know. She, she thought I was funny. Um, and then I'll stop with that. So, um, so maybe you think of tractor woo, but that's actually the, the same picture, by the way. The word is used um, to describe when Paul and Silas are thrown in prison, right? The same Greek word. I don't think that the guards wooed them to prison or like, hey, you know, come on, come this way, you know. They didn't, didn't you know, say draw them along. They bound them and took them to prison. Now, um, my point is not that salvation is in any way analogous to prison, Right? But rather that God's drawing, much like these soldiers who grabbed Paul and Silas, is effective, right? These soldiers accomplished their mission. They will do the thing they have been ordered to do without fail. So too will the grace of God. It will be effective. Okay. Second note the condition. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, this passage says, this is a reference to that inward call again. Then note the result. They come to Christ. Everyone who has heard comes to Christ, that he has spoken to in this way. Not they have the option or they might come, but rather those he has chosen. So how is this effectual calling, this hearing and learning from the Father, accomplished? Well, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit changing us. Let's look at that some more. Uh, so back, back to the comment I made earlier, I know that the prominent role of the Holy Spirit in this from our passage, right? The Holy Spirit is central to our salvation. In fact, it is, it is the the most central part of this, right? Christ's sacrifice working through us, through the Holy Spirit, drawing us to the Lord, right? He is central to our daily lives as believers as well. Now, I love this rather than this passage because the whole context of this passage today has so much good stuff in it. We could spend, oh, clearly we could spend weeks on this one passage, right? We see, for example, the Spirit effective here in intercession for our weaknesses as, as, as believers as we pray, right? We are weak. And even we who are new creations, believers, who are called, right? Um, we, d- despite that being new creations, despite that Holy Spirit within us, right? Apart from the Spirit, even we cannot pray effectively despite our best efforts, right? We don't even know what to pray for in most cases, not truly know what to pray for, but God, through the Holy Spirit, knows what we need 
and knows how to intercede for us. So if that is true of us as regenerate believers, how much more the unregenerate, right? We've said before, total depravity, dead in your sins, not sick, not hurt, not, not, not ill in any way, but a corpse, unable to do anything for itself. Given what we know of our natural state, right, this total depravity, we can't even muster the desire for God. So the second point I want to make is that the effectual calling from the passage today is that it is entirely by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And we'll see in a second, that power changes and transforms us. So finally, with regard to today's passage, I want to point out an interconnectedness while I'm here of all the doctrines of grace in this passage. They connect together here. We see this full covering of them. Reading verses uh, 29 through 30 again. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Again, notice the, the tense of that. It's an accomplished feat already. Here we see God's predestination in foreknowledge of his elect, unconditional election. We see God's conforming his elect to the life of Christ and the adoption of that elect into his family through the price paid by Christ to justify them, limited atonement. The underlying and understanding sinfulness of man that made this situation necessary is implied, total depravity. God's effectual call of his elect, his irresistible grace, is clearly mentioned. And finally, as we see, we'll see next week, the promise that those he has chosen will, and I made that all caps in my notes here, will be glorified. Not a single one will be lost to him. Perseverance of the saints. Right? To summarize, God has chosen a people, and he will not, and in fact cannot, fail in redeeming them all. So in this last observation of Romans 8, I mentioned that all the doctrines of grace are necessarily interconnected. They make a whole, a framework, a logical connectedness. Right? They form a single logical whole such that each depends on the others. This is because they are all contingent on one another. And more fundamentally, in the, in the, and one more fundamental truth, that is, and I mentioned already earlier, the sovereignty of God. This is so recognized as the truth that some have even argued that a better modern formulation would be to add an S to the end, forming the mnemonic tulips. In our elder and deacon meeting uh, this last week, um, either Mike or John, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who said, the, said this, so, but it was a funny, so I'm going to have to put it out there, uh, said that, you know, because sovereignty actually comes first, logically, we should call it stulip. That sounds pretty stupid to me. Um, but this raises a question. If sovereignty is the foundation and so logically precedes the rest, is there a better order we should consider for these? I think there is. Let's call this the effective order of the doctrines of grace. And here's how I would formulate this effective order. God is sovereign, right? In his sovereign power and the grace God has chosen, he has chosen a people, an unconditional election. But that people is separated from him by their sin, total depravity. They are broken, are sick, are bad. They are dead, not any of the rest. They are totally dead. So he, at a specific point in time, atoned for his chosen people, limited atonement. All of them through all of history, those who in the past looked forward to Christ's first coming, and those who today look forward to his second coming, his second advent, and, the re and rest in his completed work on the cross. This choice of God is effective in its work and cannot fail to draw all his chosen to him, irresistible grace. And those he has chosen, he will not, in fact, cannot lose perseverance of the saints. In the end, this forms a new acronym, or I call it SUTLIP. Now, now, maybe it's not as mnemonic as TULIPS, uh, but to paraphrase the bard, what's in a name? A SUTLIP by any other name would smell as sweet. In the end, though, all this flows from a necessary condition of God's sovereignty. If that is true, then, how do others who disagree respond with this? If we're going to say God is sovereign, how do you respond to this concept, right? Let's examine quickly two alternatives. I had a lot more of this originally, and I said, I got to cut some of this out. I, I, it's not that important in the end, except to you know that people do respond to this. Let's talk about it. The first is an old, probably the oldest view of response that we would disagree with called Pelagianism. Um, it, we would disagree with it because it's considered a heresy, so we probably should disagree with Pelagianism. Um, in its classical formulation, at least, it's considered a heresy. It goes back to the fourth or fifth century uh, guy named Pelagius, 
not surprisingly, I think. Uh, and it's originally, in its, its original formulation, it says that original sin did not kill us spiritually. It just rather made us really weak, weakened us, right? Therefore, fallen man has the power to respond positively to what is good and can actually achieve sinless perfectionism apart from Christ. Now, the more common, modern, and I'd say probably more dangerous formulation is called semi-Pelagianism, which says, fallen man has the ability within his heart to exercise faith if God first entices him to it. Basically, man can do only one good thing, choose God. Logically, though, this ends up being the same thing. It's no different than Pelagianism because it still depends on man's capacity to choose God and not rather on the transformational power of God that must regenerate us first. Uh, it requires some kind of escape hatch in our moral brokenness. The second one I want to talk about briefly again is Molinism. Again, fun names, right? Uh, you're not going to be surprised that the guy who came with this name was uh, a Mol Molinus, I think. Uh, I, I'll get to that in a second here. But I mentioned earlier that Marielle, by the way, came to her um, kind of Reformed theology at the same time I did. What I didn't say is, is what was the thing that drew her in the end. It actually was a concept called middle knowledge, right? And her realization that middle knowledge makes no sense if God is sovereign, right? Um, middle knowledge, by the way, is this idea that God chooses us because he knew we would choose him, right? So it's kind of a circular thing there. God chooses us because he looked at all possibilities and said, well, that one's going to choose me, so I choose them, right? Um, keep this at a very high level. Again, as mentioned, it came to again, Molina, Molinism came from a Louis de Molina who lived in the 1500s. So there you go. It actually was around the time of the Reformation. It was, in fact, a response to uh, the Reformation to some extent. Um, at a high level, this puts us back in the position of having a part in our own salvation, something Scripture denies. It diminishes God's nature um, because there's knowledge he must learn. Even if that knowledge is theoretical knowledge. It is something he did not have a priori, right? It also diminishes God's sovereignty in that it means he, we can thwart God's will by resisting it. Even if the foreknowledge of that resistance is what leads to God's choices, it still means that God must respond to something external to himself to get the outcome he desires, right? This is, of course, of necessity limits God's choices and therefore limits his sovereignty. But God is of unlimited sovereignty. So, what do we do with this? We have learned uh, that God's grace is weak and what it means to us. First, um, let me tell you something I learned while preparing the sermon, and this is a little tongue-in-cheek here. I learned that I am incapable of spelling the word sovereignty and irresistible correctly ever. I think every single time, and I would think about it, and like this, that, that, and I get it wrong, and thank you for autocorrect, because otherwise, a little red squiggles all throughout this. But second, and more seriously, though, um, I learned that God's grace it was effectual in, and I'm going to emphasize this word, my salvation, right? And your salvation. Note the emphasis on this word my here. I asserted earlier that the wrong view of this topic would be a picture of unwilling of being dragged, kicking and screaming into heaven. Let me turn that around and ask you of your own experience with salvation. Many of us remember a time when we were unwilling to have faith in Christ. Some were young, but some of us remember before Christ, that time in your life, right? And in fact, our every inclination was rebellion against him. We didn't want anything to do with him, right? But despite any such memories, when you did come to him, was it against your will? Or in that moment, was it was joy and gratitude? This is the effectual calling, and it is accomplished not by forcing us against our will, but rather by changing our will, our desires, and our spirit. As the prophet Ezekiel says in 36.26, he replaces our heart of stone with a heart of flesh. He puts a new spirit within us, his spirit. A few weeks ago, when talking about our depravity, Mike, uh, I believe it was Mike, he used the illustration that you can put all of your best and most appetizing fresh veggies in front of a lion. I believe it was a lion and maybe a rabbit. Uh, it was two animals, right? One that eats meat, one that eats vegetables. We get the idea, right? He said, you put your best veggies in front of this lion, right? And you say, lion, you eat these veggies. They're good for you, right? We, you're going to be so sick if you don't, right? Eat the veggies. And same thing, you get a rabbit, you put a big, nice big steak in front of it. You say, here's a rabbit, here's a steak. You need this, the protein's really good for you. You need the protein. Go ahead, go for it. And no matter how much you do that, right, that lion's going to eat the meat, and the rabbit's going to eat the veggies, right? That, that's not, because their nature is not 
changed. Their nature, and despite much you, what you tell them, the lion wants the meat and the rabbit wants the vegetables, right? Similarly, we also hear the colloquialism you've heard many times in your life, I'm sure, that we can lead a horse to water, but you can never make it drink, right? God, through the effectual power of the Holy Spirit and his elect, changes our natures and our desires. He makes the lion into a rabbit and vice versa. He leads a thirsty horse to water it cannot and would never even imagine resisting drinking. It would never want to. Um, so I have a video real quick. I want to show you if you can put it up there for me. Um, have you ever seen the YouTube video of a, uh, of a child? You can pull up here real quick. Yeah. I don't know if the sound's going to work or not. And if you're online, I'm sorry. You probably won't hear the sound. But the sound's not really important to this. This is a child's first experience with bacon. Okay? Uh, if you've never seen this before, watch the face. Okay? It's about a minute long. Right? Go ahead. <laughs> Understood. There it is. When you taste that kind of goodness, how could you ever say no to it? Why would you ever want to reject it? That is what God's Spirit does to us, right? Um, it's worth pointing out, by the way, that bacon is, um, is an amazing thing. Uh, and in fact, the thing that, according to uh, some studies, have found that if vegetarians cheat, they cheat for bacon. Yeah, so, not that this, this sermon brought to you by the bacon lobby, you know, so, no. Um, there's something so good that we cannot and would not want to resist them. The Holy Spirit changes our hearts to desire Him, right? God's effective call changed us so thoroughly that we just don't, that we don't just grudgingly accept Him. We run to Him with our arms open, joyfully embracing our Savior. We come to Him because we want to come to Him, and this is because He has already done a work of grace in our soul. This transformation is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in God's elect. So finally, though, um, and kind of our application today, many of us have friends and family who have not yet been transformed by the effectual calling of the Father. I don't doubt, now back to my story earlier, I don't doubt that hyper-Calvinists do exist. Um, but to be honest, I've never actually met one. A Calvinist should share the gospel all the more. Because God's sovereign, sovereignty means that we can't thwart his will. We can't mess it up. We can't say the wrong thing, right? There is no pressure on us to be perfect in our presentation of the gospel. We don't have to know, we don't know whom God has chosen, but we know that he uses ordinary means, like our presentation of the gospel, to call his elect as that effectual calling. What a joy to be a part of God's divine plan in that way. In the end, we are indeed called to fulfill the Great Commission. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your effectual calling, Lord, that your call changed our hearts. Lord, thank you for giving us a desire for you, for replacing our stone hearts with hearts of flesh, that we may, that they may beat for you, Lord. This week, I pray for opportunities to share your gospel, Lord, as we head into this uh, Thanksgiving weekend, Lord, truly giving thanks, Lord, for what you have done for us. Oh, and I pray for opportunities to share your gospel, Lord, and just the chance to see your effectual calling working in those who hear it. I also pray in Jesus' name. Amen.